Okay, so let's begin our semester in chapter one. In this chapter, we'll look at some of the major themes of anatomy and physiology. First of all, we'll look into form and function, some origins of biomedical science. We'll look into the scientific method a little bit. We'll look at some of the adaptations that humans have made, human structure and function, and then a little bit of an introduction to the language of medicine. Let's begin with defining anatomy versus physiology. Anatomy is the study of form. In anatomy, we dissect things and identify them and name them. We examine structures by methods of inspection, palpation, auscultation, which is listening to sounds, and percussion, where we might tap the body and feel for abnormal resistance. Comparative anatomy is when we study more than one species in order to examine structural similarities and difference and ev analyze evolutionary trends. We might look at the pentadactyl limb, for example. The five digits in our fingers are common to most other vertebrates. That may seem far-fetched when you think about a horse's hoof, but the horse stands on its middle finger, and the hoof is its middle fingernail. That's a whole nother discipline. We can also explore anatomy through surgery, opening the bodies and looking inside, medical imaging, such as radiology, where we'll look at x-ray views or MRIs or CT scans. Gross anatomy is the study of structures that can be seen with the naked eye. Cytology is the study of structure and function of just the cells. Histology is the microscopic anatomy and then ultrastructure is the molecular detail that you can sometimes see in an electron microscope. Then there's histopathology, which is the microscopic examination of tissues for signs of disease. All of these are fields that fall beneath that of anatomy. Many different options for study within anatomy. Physiology, however, is the study of function. So anatomy is all about the study of form, Physiology is all about the study of function. There are sub-disciplines of physiology. There's neurophysiology, where we look at the nervous system, endocrinology, which is the physiology of hormones, and pathophysiology, which are mechanisms of disease. In this semester, we'll look at both neurophysiology and endocrinology. However, pathophysiology is a topic of a different course altogether. Comparative physiology is where, again, we'll examine physiological processes in humans and compare them to other animals. And often we do this because there are limitations on human experimentation. We can't just cut people open and examine the processes. So we study different species to learn about all the different bodily functions. We do a lot of drug testing and experimental surgeries. And this is the basis of development for new drugs and medical procedures. So here your text goes on to talk about some of the origins of biomedical science. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but do feel free to read. It's quite a fascinating background. They discuss some of the Greek and Roman legacy behind it and then the birth of modern medicine and the influence of the Catholic Church and suppressing progress and so on and so forth. Lots of names and lots of dates. And then there's a section on the scientific method. And you've got that in general biology, but if you don't remember the scientific method and some of the inductive and deductive reasoning, then take a look at that section also. There's also a brief section on human origins and adaptations talks about evolution and selection and adaptation. Again, content of the general biology course. Definitely an interesting read, though, if you're a little rusty in that area. We'll move now into the section on human structure. In human structure, we'll look at the hierarchy of complexity. This, again, was one of the themes in general biology, but we basically look at a whole organism being a component of many organ systems. Each of these organ systems are composed of organs, and each of these organs are composed of tissues. 
The tissues are then composed of cells. The cells are composed of various organelles like mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum, so on and so forth. And then those organelles are composed of molecules. Things like inside the nucleus, we'll see macromolecules of DNA, so large complex molecules. And each of these molecules are composed of various atoms. For example, water is one of the things that sustains us, and water is H2O, which is made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. And all these molecules will come together to form larger and larger entities. When we look at an organism itself, it's a single and complete individual. There are 11 organ systems in the human body. We'll examine some of them this semester and some of them in anatomy and physiology too. An organ itself is composed of two or more tissue types. And those tissue types work together to carry out particular functions. A tissue is defined as a mass of similar cells and cell products that form discrete regions of an organ and performs a specific function. After this chapter, we'll skip over to the chapter on tissues. Cells are the smallest units of an organism that carry out all the basic functions of life. The study of these cells and their organelles is cytology. The organelles themselves are microscopic structures in the cell that carry out the individual functions of that cell. The mitochondria is the powerhouse. The endoplasmic reticulum is the packaging and shipping center. And the nucleus, the brain of the cell. So the organelles are made up of the four classes of macromolecules. You might recall from general biology, proteins, carbohydrates, fat, and nucleic acids like DNA. And each of those macromolecules are composed of atoms. Atoms are the smallest particles that have unique chemical identities. So the theory that a large complex system such as the human body can be understood by studying its simpler components is called reductionism. It was first espoused by Aristotle. And this has proven to be a highly productive approach. It's essential in scientific thinking. On the other hand, it's important to understand holism. Just as it would be very difficult to predict the workings of an automobile transmission merely by looking at a pile of its disassembled parts, you can't really predict the human personality by dissecting a brain. There are emergent properties that the whole organism cannot be predicted by simply summing up the parts. Each level we move up through this hierarchy of complexity from atoms towards organism, the more novel properties emerge. That really means that humans are much more than the sum of their parts. This is a very complementary theory to reductionism as opposed to an opposing theory. So it's important for us to look at the parts in the form of reductionism. However, in order to fully understand what's going on, we have to look at the whole. So take a moment here, shut your notes, shut your book, and see what you can recall. Two terms, two sets of terms we're going to contrast. Anatomy versus physiology, and then reductionism versus holism. So just write down as much as you can remember about each of those four terms and see if you can compare and contrast them a little bit. It doesn't matter if you get it wrong. It doesn't matter if you draw a blank. The point here is to just begin to challenge the brain to engage. The more we challenge it to recall information, the better it gets at recalling it. After you've written down as much as you can, go back through your notes and fill in the gaps. Now there's a lot of anatomical variation. No two humans are exactly alike. 70% have the most common variation of a structure and 30% of people will have some anatomically variant version. 
There are often a variable number of organs, even. Sometimes people have missing muscles, like there's a muscle in the forearm that is missing in a lot of people. Sometimes there are extra vertebrae or missing vertebrae. And then when you look at the renal arteries, there are some variations. If you look at the figure below here, you can see the normal arrangement of renal arteries and veins. And then we might see sometimes that there's a kidney in its normal place and then one that's dropped into the pelvic region. And sometimes we'll get the horseshoe-shaped kidney. So why is it we consider a growing child to be alive but not a growing crystal? If a patient's dying, at what point does it become ethical to disconnect life support equipment and remove organs for donation? If these organs are alive and they must be to serve someone else, then why isn't the donor considered alive? Such questions have no easy answers by any stretch of the imagination. But from a biological viewpoint, life is not a single property. It's a collection of properties that help distinguish life from non-life. These are those characteristics. First of all, an organism that's living has organization. They have a far higher level organization than things in a non-living world around them. They expend a lot of energy and they maintain order and break down. They also have cellular composition. Living matter is always compartmentalized into one or more cells. Metabolism is also a major characteristic of life. Living things take in molecules from the environment and chemically change them into molecules that form their own structures. They control the physiology and provide us with energy. Metabolism is the sum of all chemical changes. Anabolism is building, catabolism is breaking down, and then excretion is the removal of waste. Living things are also responsive and they're able to move away from stimuli. Responsiveness occurs at all levels, from a single cell to the entire body. It's characterized by all living things, from bacteria to ourselves. Homeostasis is a very important characteristic of life. Although the environment around us on the outside, in, within the organism, the environment is maintained in a relatively stable internal condition. The ability to maintain this internal environment is called homeostasis. Development or differentiation and growth is any change in form or function over the lifetime of an organism. In most organisms, it involves two major processes. Differentiation is the transformation of cells with no specialized function into cells that are committed to a particular task. So stem cells will differentiate into the specific cell type they were destined to become. The second aspect is growth, which is an increase in size. Some non-living things grow, but not in a way your body does. Growth of the body occurs through chemical changes metabolism. For the most part, your body's not composed of the molecules you ate, but of molecules made by chemically altering the molecules that you ate. Reproduction is immensely important for a living organism. If they can't reproduce, then we can't pass genes onto newer, younger containers, the offspring. And finally, all living things are capable of evolution. All living species exhibit genetic change from generation to generation, and therefore they evolve. This occurs because mutations or changes in the DNA are inevitable, and because environmental selection pressures endow some individuals with greater reproductive success than others. So that brings us to the end of the first section of chapter one. I'll see you very shortly for the next section where we'll look at homeostasis and negative feedback.